Commissioner of the Federal Maritime <clears throat> Commission, and also to talk about the very important issue of our colleagues working together on America's innovation investment for the future. But let me just say first about the nomination of Max Beckage to be a commissioner of the Federal Maritime Commission. The COVID pandemic has caused unprecedented congestion at our ports and supply chain disruptions and businesses and Americans are feeling the pinch of the rising prices and shortages every day on these products. The news is that our colleagues can do something about that this morning. They can do something about that this morning. At a time when our country is in need of a strong federal maritime commission, it's important that they do their oversight role, that they investigate, that they regulate unfair practices by foreign shipping companies, and they make sure that U.S. shippers, our growers and manufacturers, get a fair deal. The Federal Maritimes Commission is particularly important when it comes to ensuring that American products get access to markets around the globe. While I don't agree with the conclusion of the minority leader on our investment in helping Americans during the pandemic, I know this, that right now the Federal Maritime Commission should be investigating international shippers who are overcharging U.S. exporters. Farmers have been hard hit by congestion and shipping challenges. U.S. agriculture exports have experienced a 22% decrease in exports. Agriculture accounts for about one-tenth of American good exports and roughly 20% of what U.S. farmers and ranchers produce is sent abroad. And that's why they deserve a fair deal on shipping prices. Many of these products move by containerized freight and containerized freight cost has more than doubled since the pandemic. Washington hay producers estimate that the freight cost could be three times more expensive by this winter. In addition, freight costs, ship it, our ships are returned to Asia without, with empty containers and standing straddling on U.S. ports and docks. This is an unprecedented nature of shipping and has had a major impact on American exporters. And it's important that we understand that we need to do something about it. The National Milk Producers Federation estimates that shipping disruption cost the U.S. dairy industry nearly $1 billion in the first half of 2021. Apples are Washington's most valuable agricultural commodity with $2.1 billion in sales in 2020 and about 30 percent of the state's product is exported. According to the Washington State Apple Commission, port congestion has has producers concentrating this year more on North American markets as opposed to overseas markets that are cutting in to their profits. So for every 1 million boxes of fresh apples shifted into the U.S. domestic market, the price drops about 50 cents per box as supply begins to overtake demand. These losses impact real American jobs and the American economy. But let's look at the other side of the equation. As Washington growers and American growers and American manufacturers struggle, foreign shipping companies are reporting more than $200 billion in profit, more than double the profit that they made over the last 20 years combined. That's what these international shippers are profiting. So it doesn't have anything to do with the fact that we helped Americans get a paycheck during pandemic. It has to do with foreign companies who are overcharging U.S. producers of goods. At this critical time in our country, we need a Federal Maritime Commission to move decisively to put in place practices and regulations to address port congestion and support U.S. exporters and help them not be the target of unfair practices such as exorbitant shipping costs and the lack of access to ships. We need a commission that will take action and improve the information flow at ports and investigate these illegal practices and take enforcement action against foreign bad actors who are overcharging U.S. exporters and other shippers. We need a commission who will stand up to foreign shipping interests and protect American manufacturers, farmers, and other exporters. So yes, Madam Chair, there is something we can do, Madam President, about our supply chain woes, particularly for states who have big export economies. 
That is why American shippers American shippers and producers, American shippers meaning the people who are actually shipping product, that's why American shippers and producers are behind the nomination of Max Vekage. Because Mr. Vekage knows the ports, he knows the shipping community, and has spent more than 40 years working on the waterfront. He spent his life working in the maritime industry and knows the challenges that we face in maritime, in intermodal transportation, in congestion, and continuing to move forward on how we advance our ports. If you have worked on the docks for 40 years, I guarantee you, you know about every product and you know what are the challenges that we face from this international competition. We are on the precipice of moving important competitive legislation, but part of that competitive legislation is getting our products on vessels instead of being stranded at the docks and preventing shipping companies from retaliating against U.S. exporters. Again, the majority of this product is moved by international shippers. It's an international business. So we need a commission in place that is willing to act, a commission that is willing to use their authority to enforce our current laws and to make sure we are protecting American exporters. That is why exporters like the Idaho Dairy Association supports Max Vekage, because they know he knows how to move product. That is why the American Association of Port Authorities and trade associations representing more than 80 ports across the United States support Max Vekage, citing his unique leadership as a longtime maritime worker in the sector. The Pacific Northwest Waterways Association represents ports, tug and barge companies, steamship operators, grain elevator operators, agricultural producers, forest product manufacturers, electric utilities, irrigation districts, and businesses throughout Idaho, Oregon, and Washington. This organization does not typically endorse candidates for these federal offices, but today they are calling for Mr. Vegage to be confirmed on the basis of, quote, his firsthand knowledge of the maritime industry and its operations, end quote. Mr. Beckage knows what it takes to move product from the heartland. He knows that in our Washington ports, we are helping U.S. farmers get their products to market. So I know whether it's wheat or soybeans or other ag products, he knows what it takes to move them and what it takes for us to continue to improve the efficiency of our ports. Whether it is the Midwest manufactured products like cars and Jeeps, he knows what that takes and what it takes to continue to grow and skill a workforce that will help us do that cost effectively. He knows how to work with industry like agricultural producers and the waterfront workforce alike. So at a time when we're asking our dock workers, our longshoremen to work around the clock to help elevate and uh, our efficiencies and improve port congestion, and I might say, Madam Chair, at the loss of life. The, the, the amount of uh, deaths in the longshoremen community uh, would break your heart that they continued to work during the COVID crisis and literally lost their lives. And this is what these people are doing. They're helping us keep our supply chain going. So at least we could do is invest in somebody who is going to help us understand what it takes to do that on a day-to-day -day basis. We need to make sure that we have a competitive and fair environment for U.S. companies. So I ask my colleagues to confirm Max Vekage as Commissioner of the Federal Maritime Commission uh, this morning. Madam Chair, I'd also, oh, I'll enter in the record a list of supporters, as I mentioned, the uh, Idaho Dairy Association, Dairy Gold, Northwest Dairy Association, uh, Tote Maritime, Saltchuk, Foss, Matson, SSA Marine, Carnival, uh, Transportation Institute, the ILWU, uh, Inland Boatmen's uh, Union, uh, uh, the local chapters of the Farm Union, uh, and many other organizations. I'll enter that into the record. Without objection. Thank you, Madam Chair. Now I'd like to turn our attention to the um, also an issue of dealing with our supply chain. That is the issue of Congress moving forward on the differences between the House and Senate bill on America's investment in R&D 
and innovation. As the chart shows you, our investment today equals U.S. jobs in our economy tomorrow. So the United States Competition Act, or as we passed it here, the United States Innovation uh, uh, Act is at a crossroads because we need to get it into conference. Other countries definitely aren't waiting, I guarantee you that. They are making investments in innovation and technology. And where we are in the United States is we are at a 45-year low at the amount of investment in R&D against our GDP. So we're not keeping pace. And many times I've been out on the floor here talking about why we're not keeping pace. Uh, we tried. Unfortunately, we tried um, uh, several years ago and then had an economic downturn. So everybody signed up, let's put more into R&D investment, then we had an economic downturn and then we never fulfilled that promise. So the real consequences of that is that we are now behind in some very key sectors that we need to make investments in. The good news for us is that uh, people are willing to make those investments, like the Intel company who just decided recently to make a, a multi-billion dollar investment in the state of Ohio to grow chip fabrication there. And so we have opportunities if we make these investments. When the world presents a challenge, the American people, the people in our state, they rise to a challenge, and the American spirit has never ceased to amaze me. I guarantee you innovation is in the R&D of Americans. Why? Because we live in a country where, where it's free to do what you want. It's free for you to go and start a company and, and to try your skill set. We encourage it. And we need to have that same spirit here working collaboratively to get this legislation rectified and onto the president's desk. There isn't a moment to wait. Revolutionizing science, creating jobs, invigorating our new economic centers around the nation. And my colleague and I, Senator Wicker, worked on a very important aspect of the bill, which is driving more innovation dollars into research institutions in states that haven't traditionally had large research, research footprints. This will be an issue of contention, I'm sure, with some of our colleagues. But my point is innovation can happen anywhere, and innovation infrastructure should be everywhere. And so if we want that to happen, Madam, Chair, Madam President, in Reno, Nevada, we need to make an investment in Reno, Nevada. I believe in that because I'm pretty sure Sierra uh, Company is a very big leader in the aerospace sector, and I think they're headquartered in Reno, if I'm not mistaken. And this is what I'm talking about. You can build, and guess what? Not everything has to happen in Seattle or San Francisco or Boston or out here on the, uh, the corridor here in Virginia. And that is because the innovation age means that innovation can happen at a very flat level. It can happen anywhere. So why would we constrict it? We don't want to constrict it. We want to empower it. So American leadership can't wait. What we need is to be collaborative here in the United States Senate because that collaboration between government, academia, and industry is what drives the next level of innovation. Just think about what happened with, uh, with uh, ARPA, DARPA, as we made the innovations in the internet. As the uh, president knows, because she's a programmer, she knows that that innovation allowed us to then uh, build uh, out a commercial aspect of the internet that would not have uh, happened, at least at that moment in time, not in uh, 1993, wouldn't have happened, and look at where we are today with an internet economy, all because we had U.S. innovation. So technology after technology has been invented, and our U.S. companies have continued to innovate, develop a workforce, and skill people for the opportunities of tomorrow. But that leadership is not guaranteed. And time and time again, history has shown us that people, while we innovate here, other people are going to follow. In aviation, the Wright brothers were the first to demonstrate with the Kitty Hawk in North Carolina, but the United States soon fell behind in aviation as European governments invested and built out this new industry. By 1913, the United States military had six planes and 14 trained pilots. France had 216 airplanes and 171 trained pilots. So leadership can't wait. You can't wait. And I think people get this. 
We do a lot of the innovation, and other people take that innovation and go implement it. That is why a major section of the bill is about translational science. It is about taking that innovation in the United States and translating it into faster adoption applications for industries. So Congress finally decided to invest in American leadership in 1915 by creating the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, which worked with academia and industry to regain Americans' dominance and define how we build planes that even last today. That's what we're talking about. That's why we feel that NASA is part of this bill. NASA is our R&D agency for aviation. That is what NASA is. Yes, it deserves a place in this legislation. A new aviation industry, a new aviation supply chain sprung up across the country in places like Wichita and Kansas and Seattle. The story would repeat itself after the Soviet Union challenged U.S. leadership in the 1950s, and almost immediately Congress recognized that leadership could not wait, and that is when we did NASA. So bringing together government, academia, and industry to create new generations of American expertise and technical advancements is what eventually put people, a man, on the moon, and what will put someone, a woman this time, on the moon. But America had to choose to lead. That's what we're going to be asked with on USICA and getting it done. We have to choose to lead, to invest in technology. That technology brought us places like Huntsville, Alabama, and Houston, Texas. In 2020, the aerospace industry supported 2 million good-paying jobs with an average salary of 100, uh, over $100,000 per year and generated $900 billion in revenue. That's what the innovation economy did for us. So that's why we want to now upgrade the innovation, particularly as it relates to semiconductors. Since the availability of these tiny chips and one of the most pressing, uh, it, one of the most pressing issues facing our country now is people can't get access to them. People who, uh, it's so bad, Madam President, that people now who have cars that are uh, elect, uh, electric cars or hybrids. If you have a used car, you, you know that your price goes down, just continues to go down. Now used cars price are actually going up because there's so few cars available that the consumers want in this area that actually used cars are getting more money. It's going up and not down. The shortage cost the transportation sector $210 billion last year alone. We can't wait. We can't wait on these issues. We can't wait. Essence of acting now, getting together, communicating with our colleagues, working to together in a collaborative spirit is what is going to get this legislation over the goal line and help us. The first transistor as part of this chip industry was invented in 1947 in New Jersey, representing a collaboration from scientists across physics, electrical engineering, and chemistry. But in the 1980s, the United States semiconductor industry faced a serious challenge from an ally of ours, Japan. Leadership did not wait. We did not wait. The government set up a government industry partnership, Semitech, with specific goals of creating new collaborations and investing in American manufacturing. The United States maintained that leadership role, and in the 1990s, we produced 37% of the global chip supply. The semiconductor industry now supports more than a million jobs. But today, because people didn't stand around and wait, but today we see overseas competitors who are investing heavily in technologies of the future, from everything from AI to composites to clean energy solutions, and they are trying to do everything from driving their own energy independence to combating climate change. They are invest investing in the resilience of their supply chain by promoting domestic production. They are training their workforce. So the aspects of the legislation that we passed that helped skill and keep Americans working and train a workforce, very important policies. In fact, the administration just released yesterday another round of investment as part of what was the aerospace and manufacturing jobs program that helped keep the aviation worker in place or actually try to recapture some of them who were laid off during the pandemic. 
very important piece of legislation that we worked on that my colleagues over here, for the most part, didn't support in the final package. Some of them supported it as a concept and an idea, but did not support the final package. Right now, it's 30 to 50 percent cheaper to build a semiconductor foundry in Asia than in the United States, mostly because of foreign government investment. Moreover, as I said, we're being hard hit by semiconductor supply chain crisis. Car manufacturers, including Tesla, GM, and others, are removing some of their most advanced and desirable features from their cars just to reduce the number of chips that are needed. Literally, we're cutting our innovation skill set just because we don't have the chips. Ford announced last week that it will either halt or cut production at eight plants. Do we really, are we really going to sit around and wait to get this legislation done? Are we really going to sit around and wait? We have eight plants that are going to shut down because they don't have chips, and we're going to sit around and wait for another three or four weeks before we go to conference to resolve these issues. It has been projected that chip shortage cost the global auto industry in 2021 $210 billion in revenue and a loss a production of 7.7 .7 million cars. So leadership can't wait. It can't wait. Fortunately, the United States is showing that we can respond, and we in the Senate did pass legislation, and now we have an opportunity to go to conference and work with our colleagues, but some people want to wait another three weeks or four weeks to do that. I don't want to wait, Madam President. I don't want to wait another second the competitiveness of U.S. manufacturers who are competing on an international basis to receive the investments that we make in technology just can't wait. Recent investments from commercial sector from Intel show that over 10,000 new jobs will bring a domestic semiconductor industry to the Midwest, specifically Ohio. And our experience has shown us that if we make the investments that we're talking about in USICA, if we in the Competitiveness Act, that we will grow an even larger U.S. semiconductor manufacturing business. But foreign competitors are not sitting still. When it comes to technology leadership, they are obviously going to try to do their part. So our solution is simple. All we have to do is work together. All we have to do is be collaborative. As someone uh, once said, collaboration is the next phase of innovation. You can have all the science, you can have all the creativity, but if you can't get it implemented because people don't sit around the table and talk and innovate and work together, then you can't get it implemented. That's where we are. We know we need to do this investment in R&D. We know that we need to invest in chips, and we're not doing it because some people don't want to move ahead and get this done. The Senate Commerce Committee passed the legislation, and we obviously got and understood the urgency of it. We got and understood the urgency of it. Trust me, Madam President, there are many other things we thought we were going to put on our agenda, and you know because you sat through the hundreds of amendments that were marked up, the process that we went through, the regular order, the regular order that we went through here on the Senate floor, and the regular order we're willing to go through. So no one's asking for anything else but regular order. But the people who want to hold up and don't want to move forward, I would ask them to think about our competition who are working very hard on beating us at semiconductors and the issues that it represents as it relates to the investments we should be making. So I want us to make the investments in semiconductors. I want us to make the investments in manufacturing extension programs, in STEM education, in tech hubs, and making sure that the United States of America maintains its leadership role. I thank the President, and I yield the floor.